One Was Stubborn by L. Ron Hubbard. Author's Note. This present manuscript is a paraphrase of one which is very strange indeed. I have included in all its essentials and have removed from it only that which was rambling and incoherent. The original came to me in the hands of a peculiar old fellow who was admitted for treatment to Balm Springs. He had a very stubborn quality about him which made him nearly impossible to treat, and this intractability earned him the pseudonym of Old Shellback among the interns and psychiatrists. Oddly, he came with no past history and refused to give any. No one could learn for some time where he had been born or whether he had any people alive. And then one day, with a rock-jawed glare at my insistence, he said, My mother and father have yet to be born. If I have any ancestors living in this country, now I am positive I won't see them. The place I was born will not be built for another 300 years and... When I was born in it, it was already 250 years old. It is gone because it has yet to exist. It will be gone thereafter because it will cease to exist. I am a negative 590 years old. Tomorrow, my birthday, I shall be a negative 589. I have less than 30 years of life expectancy remaining to me and so I shall not live to be more than a negative 560 years. What has happened to me has happened because of what happened to the universe, but mainly because there is but one God and his name will be George Smiley. You haven't tried to make me do anything, therefore I shall give you the manuscript which explains this. I wrote it when I was marooned a little while, about 80 years from now, in Paris just after the United States began to rebuild it. And so he brought me the manuscript. It had evidently been written under stress for the first half dozen pages are illegible as compared to the graceful script of the remainder. Old Shellback grew restless after he had been with us six or seven months, for he seemed to sense danger in all clocks. In fact, a man had only to take out a watch, and old Shellback would dive for his cubicle and refuse to come forth the rest of the day. Then he began to mutter over and over. Not far enough back. Not far enough back. Not far enough back. Nothing could be found as the cause of this, but old Shellback seemed to think the menace quite valid. And then one day he came rushing into my office, it was a New Year's Day, and demanded his original manuscript, which, of course, I gave him. I had no thought of what he might do, and what he did was quite startling. Old Shellback was seen to lock himself into his room. There was no egress therefrom. An hour later, when he would not respond, we forced the door. On the bed was a note. My apologies to Dr. Lafayette, but this is not far enough back, you see, not far enough back. Old Shellback was gone. I thought it was my vision. For some time, my wife had been mag nagging me about glasses, telling me that I ought to get those Brillo scopes that were always being advertised on the three-dimensional color television. But somehow, the more I heard, see like a cat and feel like a million with brilloscopes, the invisible optic aids, the less inclined I was to get a pair. And so when I beheld a pair of legs walking toward me all by themselves, I of course concluded that it was my vision. In fact, for some days, things had been getting slightly misty and the mist was deepening. But to see a pair of legs with pants neatly pressed and shoes precisely tied, walk up to you and by you and around the corners, well, even I could see that I must give in. I stepped onto the express conveyor belt and went whizzing off toward the medical center. And as I sped along, I again received a shock. The great glistening domes of Science Center, usually so plainly seen from all levels of the city, 
save the third trucking tier under the glass subways, were missing one of their number. I supposed, of course, that the Transstellar Express might have swished too close to it on the night before, but I was wrong. For when I diverted my eyes for a moment to avoid being struck by a fat woman's anti-gravity cane, and then looked through the invisible super levels at the place where the dome had been, the dome was back in place. I certainly did need glasses. I was so groggy when I stepped off the conveyor belt and grabbed the scoop, which lifted up to the medical department level that I didn't even see a crazy college student swing off level 20 in his antique arable swishabout. One of those things with signs over the dent saying, Eve, here's your Adam. 10 tubes, all dis disintegrating. Hey, babe, didn't we meet on Mars? You know the menace. Well, one of those blasted straight at me and I didn't even have time to duck. And I probably couldn't have anyway, thanks to my rheumatism. And if I had been startled before, I was prostrate now. That swish about rattled to the right and left and above and below and was gone. I passed all the way through it. I was almost scared to let go of the bucket and step out on the eye level for fear the invisible walk was not only invisible, but also not there. Somehow, I hauled myself up to the sorting cycle while the bean calculator sized me up. And then when the Fleischer had been blinked Dr. Flurry as its decision for me, I managed to sink down on the sofa, which whisked me into his office. The nurse smiled pleasantly and said, Nervous disability is quite easy to correct, and Dr. Flary is expert. Please be calm. I haven't got any nervous disability, I said. I came up here to get tested for some glasses. She looked at one of those confounded charts that the sorting psyker forwards ahead of the patient. And when I saw her finger come down to stubborn, I knew she'd nod. She did. A thoroughly unmanageable young woman. You haven't been brought to an eye doctor. Dr. Flary treats nervous disability only, as you must know. I came for an eye test, I said. And I'm going to get an eye test. I don't give a flim doodle what that blathery card says. It's eyes. You think a machine knows more about me than I do? Sometimes a machine does. Now, please don't get upset. I'm not upset. I guess I know when I need glasses and when I don't need glasses. And if I wanted to be tested for glasses, I pretty well guess I'll be tested for glasses. You are obviously a stubborn sort of fellow. I guess that I'm the most stubborn fellow in this city, if not in this whole country. Don't tell me. Well, I don't know why, but I felt a little better after that. And shortly, Dr. Flary buzzered me into his inner office. He was one of those disgusting young fellows who think they know so much about the human body that they themselves can't be human. Now be calm and tell me just what the trouble is. He seemed to be in a sort of ecstatic state and he didn't seem to take me seriously enough. I won't be calm, I said, and I don't have to tell you what the trouble is. You've got a psyker chart there that will tell you all about me, even down to my last wart. Yes, you do have a war. I should have Dr. Demester remove it before you go. You won't touch any war of mine, I said. I came in here to get a pair of glasses, and by the eternal, I'll get them if I have to sit here all night. I guess I had him there, for he sat and stared at me for some little time before he replied. Now... What is making you nervous? I am not nervous. I want glasses. Uh. And then he sat back 
and pushed his head against a pad so the mechanical chair arm would put a lighted cigarette in his mouth. My dear fella, tell me just why you need a pair of glasses. Because I need them, that's why. Reading glasses? Reading glasses? I never read any of the bills the papers are ordered to publish. Then you watch the television quite a bit. I wouldn't turn one of those things on for a million dollars. What do you ever hear but advertising and smoky bands? And what do you see but girls with legs? Bah! I guess I was telling him now. Ah. Uh. And he thumped back with an elbow so that his chair's arm would pour him a glass of water. But you don't need a pair of glasses to talk to people. I never talk to people. I never talk to anybody except my wife. And I don't talk to her. And she doesn't listen to me any more than I listen to her. She never says three words a week to me anyway. Which is the way things should be, of course. What, may I ask, is your business? You've got a nerve to ask me. But for your information, I haven't got any business. I retired off my farm about four years ago, and I haven't spent a happy hour since. Ah. Uh. Don't sit there saying, ah, like an idiot, I said. Get busy and fit me with a pair of glasses. You haven't said why you needed them. You can have a pair, of course. But to give them to you, I'll have to know just what sort of glasses you mean. What convinced you that you should have them? I could see that I had scared Dr. Fleury into being polite to me. So I told him that I had seen a pair of legs without a torso and had first missed and then seen one of the medical center domes and how that crazy college student had run right through me. Well, if Dr. Fleury hadn't stopped laughing when he did, I guess we would have mixed it up right then. What's so funny? I demanded. <laughs> My dear fellow, you don't need any pair of glasses. If you ever paid any attention to the newspapers or the television or talked to anyone, you'd understand what is happening. And what is happening? Why, my dear fella, is it possible you haven't heard of the Messiah? Him? What about him? Would you care to come around to our meeting tonight? You might be edified. I don't like meetings. I don't believe in meetings. But, my dear fellow, the Messiah will... I don't believe in messiahs. Well, however, that may be. I wonder at you. You are probably the only man in the world today that is not a follower. Let me explain to you what this is all about so that... I don't want to know anything about it. And I wouldn't believe it if I did. Nevertheless, let me tell you something about this. The Messiah, Arctuus Arcton, is teaching the non-existence of matter. You see, by that he means that all matter is an idea. And it is high time the world was relieved from the crushing load of materialism, which has almost quenched the soul of man. Those are his words, and it is true. Man is putting, being pushed all around by machines, and the age of machines has been over for over a century. But the machines just keep running, and man, being he is so lazy, keeps using them. Now, it may surprise you that a man such as myself, depend upon the ills of the body as I am, should advocate the loss of the body. But I get no interest out of my trade, for everything about the body is known, except, of course, the soul. And the Messiah has a good line on that. Further, in common with the rest of humanity, I am bored. I am so bored that I welcome any diversion. 
And I know that all this material world and this body I drag around are some useless sources of annoyance. Now, the Messiah is teaching us the folly of belief. So long as we believe the world, this universe, in machines and ills and mankind, then mankind shall survive and the world and the universe and the machine shall survive. But as soon as we lose all belief in these things, then we shall be freed. We shall be freed, my friend from the agony caused by machines and other men and being slaves to cogwheels. The only answer is to abolish the very matter which those same cogwheels and these same bodies are made. Well, matter does not really exist. You know, it is only a figment of our imaginations. We believe in matter. And so there is matter. That, my dear friends, is the glorious message you have missed by not listening or reading. You mean that everybody belongs to this? Certainly. Hasn't this whole world been miserable ever since all further advances was unattainable? And isn't this the one answer to our misery? But, but where will everyone go? Why, we return to our proper position as a compound idea, and we shall have nothing that is miserable or worrying. But you won't even exist. Certainly not, he said with a tired smile. And he nudged with his elbow and tilted his head back while his chair's arm poured another glass of water down his throat. Languidly, then he nodded to me. You don't need a pair of glasses, my dear fellow. You are only witnessing the fruits of our combined disbelief. Several people happened to disbelieve that dome. And then the college student probably didn't believe in his swish about, and you about to be killed by it, refuse to believe in it either. So come around to our meeting tonight and hear all about it. It really is quite fascinating. He yawned in boredom and pushed a pedal, which shot, his, shot my sofa car out to the eye level again. I stepped down on a bucket. Wouldn't it be awful, I thought, if this bucket didn't exist? but it evidently still did. And nothing happened till I was being speeded home on the conveyors. The Trans System 515 local roared away from its field to the north. And when it had obtained the zenith, it suddenly vanished. There wasn't so much of, as a puff of smoke left in the sky. And about 10 seconds later, it appeared again 50 or 60 miles up, visible because of its exhaust flames in the, in the dusk. When I got home, I went to bed behind a locked door. The bed, at least, showed no sign of vanishing. And if things were going to persist in refusing to exist, I vowed I wouldn't leave that room until my condenso chow and my stock of old Space Ranger gave out. I went out three times in three weeks, and twice I came back so badly unnerved then again, I barricaded myself. For the things which were happening clearly showed that the world had gone completely mad. And maybe not only the world, but the universe as well. I recalled a fragment of talk I had heard concerning the disease machine madness. And I was now convinced that the disease had invaded everyone and that it was even invading me my wife hadn't spoken to me for so long that one day when she stuck her head in the door and announced that a gentleman was here to see me. A gentleman is here to see you. I noticed for the first time that all was not well with her. She had a sort of ecstatic fixity about her face 
It could not even be broken by animosity towards me. The gentleman came in. He had a robe of blue flesh tech wrapped around him so that he was mostly hypnotic eyes. He said, My name is George Smiley. I am called the Messiah. I must admit that I was never so close to being frightened in my life. He brought down his arm a little and exposed his face. And if I have ever in my life seen anything sardonic, it was the grin he wore. He was not handsome nor tall, but there was some kind of presence to him, which would have singled him out from a million made up exactly like him. What do you want with me? I merely wish to speak with you. Then go ahead. A Dr. Flurry, number 483-936-3297-0248-G, has reported to me that you may be the one responsible for the way things are progressing. We have done away with the disbelief of some thousands like you, and you, and, and you are the last one. I understand that you have neither heard nor read of the great eclipse. I couldn't look him in the eyes so I watched the way his flash tech cape rippled. All I know is what Dr. Flurry told me. And still you were not interested enough to attempt to believe with the rest? Why should I be interested? Because this vitally concerns your happiness. Have you no wish to defeat the mechanism and organization which has enslaved mankind? Have you no desire to liberate yourself from the toils of a miserable existence? I can do that with a splash gun. I don't have to believe in you to do it. Ah, and there you are wrong. If you kill yourself, you will not share. Is there no way to convince you that our precepts are the only precepts? I can grow cabbage and I can milk cows. And I have stayed healthy so far by not listening to anybody on the subject of anything. You are wasting your time with me. You mean you refuse? I guess that's what I mean. You are a very stubborn man. I believe what I want to believe. I believe this is a world. And anybody that tries to tell me that this glass and bottle are not real is going to get an awful argument from me. Then my hand is forced. I sent no minions. I came myself. You are the last man. I and the rest of the universe shall, shall cease to believe in your soul, and you shall cease to exist. Good day. Good day. He looked back once from the door. I was trying to pour myself a drink, but the bottleneck chattered against the glass and the old space ranger spilled. I felt his eyes and then there weren't a bottle and a glass in my hands. I held nothing. Good day. He said again in a cheerful voice. He was gone. During the remainder of that day, I did nothing more than sit and look at the patterns in the fluffoplex floor. I was half angry, half scared, and I was trying my best to understand just what George Smiley, the Messiah, was doing. I've been told that I have a suspicious nature. However that may be, I suspected George Smiley. Every person I had seen for weeks, now that I came to think about it, had had that strange, that same strange fixity of expression which my wife had borne, just as though everyone had become a saint. It was much against my principles to surrender to the extent of examining the problem. But at last, when night, as I thought, had come, I went into the next room and fumbled around until I found what papers my wife had accumulated during the past month or two. I sat and read then for nearly two hours. But at the end of that time, I was not even close to a solution. All I discovered was that George Smiley had come from Arcton with a message. Of course, I knew that everyone in the universe was bored and would welcome any kind of diversion, and that such a time 
according to my Tribune's rise and fall of the American empire, provided unscrupulous men with a host of willing dupes for religious experimentation. That many of these had been maniacs was the fact that Dr. Tribben, the great unbeliever, italicized. But so far in history, no one man had managed to swing a nation, much less the universe, around to his method of thinking. But it had been so long since any man had had to develop an original idea that almost any idea would have been acceptable. I suppose that it was the perfection of communication which made it possible for George Smiley to reach everyone, everywhere. And the freedom which the machine magistration gave all religious exponents accounted for George Smiley's not being stopped. And worse luck, it seemed that I was the only man left that didn't want to slip off into the limbo. It had already been proven that mass concentration could do away with material objects. But that fact was so old that until now, it had lain dormant except in the pranks of schoolboys who, learning about it for the first time, vanished desks out from in front of their professors. George Smiley, according to these reports, was a virile fellow who had lived alone for years and years as a prospector on Arcton. But the fact that his parents were not known made me believe that perhaps both his father and his mother had finished this life as members of the famous Arcton prison, to which so many universal criminals were shipped. Did this George Smiley have a grudge against the whole universe? That sardonic smile of his and those terrifying eyes. Well, it wasn't going to do me any good to sit and moon over the papers. Besides, I felt I had better put them back before my wife found I was reading them. Such surrender was unthinkable. Accordingly, I walked out into the living room and fell. There must be ground under me. I lit. And then I sat there, staring all about me in helpless bewilderment. There wasn't any living room anymore. Maybe, maybe in my own room. No, there was no sign of that either. The papers, the papers I'd been holding in, in my hand. For a second, one sheet rustled and then it too faded away. There was something solid under me, but that was all the solidity anywhere. The city, perhaps the world, perhaps everything was a flood of gray and curly mist. I felt it myself and was relieved to know that I was still myself anyway. For an instant, I had wondered and wondering, had felt myself thin and pale. But I was again solid, and that upon which I was seated was still ground, and so I took slight heart. What, I wondered, had happened to my wife? And what had happened to the house and the city? Certainly there must be something left of the city. And I began to feel that if I couldn't find something of it, I should certainly go mad. No more condenso chow. No more old space ranger. Oh my goodness. Yes, I had to find the city. I stood up and groped before me my hands nearly invisible in the murk. Step by step, I found ground. And once, I thought, I saw the corner of a building. But when I approached it closely, it too was gone. For what seemed an hour, I floundered about without being able to locate a street. I was getting angry, probably because I was getting scared. I consulted my watch and found out it was half past 10. For what seemed a long while, I kept on working along, expecting any moment to find a wall or a conveyor belt or a parked auto airbill, but each next moment being disappointed. Finally, I again looked at my watch. It was still half past 10. I thought that I must have missed the hands the first time in the absence of light, but there was no missing them now, for the dial glowed softly 
and the mist itself seemed to have some quality of illumination. And then having groped for what seemed yet a third half hour, I looked once more at my watch. It was still half past 10. What had happened to time? Was I adrift in something which wasn't space? There were no quiz clickers gaping for their pennies and their questions on each lamppost anymore. So I had to try and answer it myself. Yes, there was space. I could feel myself and I knew I moved and so there must be space. If it took me time to move, perhaps, I thought, I had better locate someone else before I went completely mad. For all this murk was seeping into my heart, like drifting smoke, it curled and wound and spired, leaving black alleys stretching endlessly out and then rolling in upon openings and swallowing them, leaving towers which stretched in infinity up and down and then devouring the towers. The very solidity on which I trod was hidden. There was no direction to anything. And I felt that I might well be upside down or horizontal for all I knew. And I might not be walking on anything at all. And at that thought, I began to fall. And falling, I feared earth. And fearing earth, I landed. I was ill. The thought that I must keep earth in mind or fall again was enough to make me do just that. And when again I was, on, I was upon solidity, I understood that I might drop an infinity step by step and never arrive at anything. With great suddenness, it came to me that so long as I believed in myself, I was. So long as I believed there was space, I was adrift in a murky ocean of mist, drowned in an immensity of nothingness marooned in non-existence. I must find somebody. I could not tolerate being alone. And so I stumbled forward, groping hopefully. I was not used to walking any more than anybody else had been used to it. And I began to tire. I had fallen far, I knew, and I supposed I would have to rise again to the same altitude of the city's site before I could discover anything. But I was wrong. I'd begun to wish violently for a bucket to bear me upward and then, banging my shins, I ran into the bucket. I'd been wandering so long and so far without any contacts that I gripped that bucket as one grips a long friend found again. Joyously, I put my feet upon it. Gratefully, I sank into its fluffoplex arms and upward I went. I was almost certain now that I had sunk no lower than the fifth level subsurface, for there the buckets began. And so I waited patiently for the conveyance to gently alight me upon a higher level. But I just kept on going up. Ordinarily, it used to take a bucket not more than a minute to lift anyone 20 levels. But I realized I had been sitting there at least five minutes ascending swiftly through impenetrable mist. In sudden panic, I wondered where I was going. No bucket I had ever seen could have gone as high as this. Why, why, I must be on a level with the court domes. Or, God help me, I must be about to crash through the weather roof. Suddenly, I beheld the glass pane above. The bucket here hit it squarely and rebounded. Madeleine gripped at the chair arms. What if this bucket should vanish? What if the bucket too should cease to exist? And it did. I fell through the giddy mists. Only an air cab could have saved me. And then I wasn't falling. I was sitting in an air cab. For several seconds, I just sat there, clinging thankfully to the seat not thinking at all about where I might be going. The driver must have seen me falling and zipped under me and was waiting now for me to recover my breath before he asked my destination. I leaned past the meter. Thank you. If you'll take me to Food Central, I'll be very grateful. A face, a face. 
and nothing more, glowed briefly above the bar controls and a voice snarled. You can't do this to me. Who the hell do you think you are? And the face was gone and the air cab went purring along, utterly driverless. I was shaken, for it took me some time to understand just what was happening to me. I felt that if I went on like this much longer without the solace of a drink, I should perish. Oh, for a little snort of old space ranger. I drank it off and instantly felt better. And then I felt worse. I hadn't been carrying a glass of old space ranger around with me all this time. And there wasn't anybody about who could have placed it in my hand. And yet I had just drunk. And instead of being in that air cab, I was sitting on nothing. What had happened to the air cab? Certainly I still must be in it. And there I was, purring along in the air cab again. Driver, I said, I don't understand. Don't try it on me snarled a face beside the meter, it vanished, all but the eyes. And these were so malevolent that I looked away. The air cab vanished too. I sat very still on whatever this solidity was and tried to get myself straightened out. I had spoken to that driver twice and each time he had almost appeared. And I felt that the next time I tried to bring him out, he would certainly deal roughly with me after the way of Hackey's. Each time I had imagined things, it seemed that those things had come to pass. Was I then a figment of my own imagination? Shiver the thought. Could I bring anything I wanted into being with my own thought? In his rise and fall of the American empire, Tribbin hinted at the future possibility that the world and even the universe might be destroyed by combined thought. The world and the universe evidently being nothing but an idea. Had humanity committed mass suicide or mass combination to the exclusion of matter? And was I then the only one left whose belief in his own individuality was so great that that individuality still existed? And being the only individual mind still possessed by a man, could I create at will? Or was I doomed forever and ever to drift aimlessly through this clammy mess, timeless and alone? I could not bear the thought. Tribbin had stated that man's one redeeming feature was his own ability to create, and that he, therefore, assigned creativeness to God. And Tribbin had said, that when man no longer created, then man would no longer be. I had been the, ma the last manual farmer. Was I then the last man with ability to create? Certainly, if anything could be saved or if anything could exist, then it must be created by myself. That was it. I must create. I glowed with the idea. I walked around on my created solidity and laughed out loud. Always before, I had had to callous my hands and be sweat my brow. But now, I only had to think. And what things wouldn't I create? I came as close to dancing as I ever did in all my life. The mist. I would create sunlight. With all my wit, I concentrated, and then, then a shaft of light came from somewhere and played its beam upon me and warmed my rheumatic bones. Sunlight, by my own imagination, I could bring to being light and warmth and cheer. I sang out, so great was my joy. Now let me create a meadow, a meadow which I would surround with trees and cross with a brook. I closed my eyes and concentrated. And when I opened them again, there was the meadow. I started to caper out into the tall grass and then mid pace, stopped dead still. What had happened to the sunlight? The mist so befogged this meadow 
that it could scarcely be seen. Sunlight, sunlight. And there it came again, that pleasant golden beam. But as soon as the sunlight came, the meadow vanished. How uncertain this all was. Was it possible that I could create, but not enduringly? That I could create and maintain only one object at a time? Did these things depend wholly upon my ability to concentrate upon them? And even while I pondered the question, the sunlight faded before the mist and I was again surrounded by clammy grayness. But for all my disappointment, I had established one thing, that I could bring things into being even if I could not maintain them. Certainly, there must be some solution to this sort of thing. If I gave it enough thought, Perhaps I could manage a way to trap sunlight and meadows into reality. I sat down on my, on my solidity and pursed my lips and stroked my chin. Try as I might, I could not remember if Tribbin had had anything to say upon the subject of concentration. I thumbed hopefully through the index, but the only reference close to it was concentration camps, New York, San Francisco, Washington. I stared into the mist a while, and when I looked back at the book, it was gone. Oh, well, I thought, I would rather have some old Space Ranger anyway. I drank it off, and it made me hungry. So I added, ate a steak. Feeling better, I again got restless. I could not sit around on an imagined solidity for all eternity. I would call down the sunlight at will, but I couldn't keep it there. And so I gave over. And then it occurred to me that the reason I thought I was standing upon something was because I had always stood upon something and was so used to the idea that I could not shake it. And the instant it became an idea only, I fell and I became scared and I landed. If I could only talk this over with someone, I sighed. But I was careful not to think I saw anyone, for people did not seem to like being hauled back from wherever they had gone. Certainly somewhere in all this, there must be at least one other man. To think that I was the only one was conceit of the most outrageous kind. Somewhere there was somebody and if he and I could just get together, then he might know enough, and I might know enough, to put some semblance of a world together and keep it together. Again, I wandered and floundered and fell when I thought about my solidity and landed and pawed through this endless mist. Once or twice, I thought I saw people, but I could not be sure, for I was careful not to think they were people. And when I had spent a timeless space in tumbling about, I forgot my caution and seeing a misty thing which looked like a man, thought he was a man. Very briefly, he assumed a shape. It was nebulous and distorted as though I looked at him through a drinking glass just emptied of milk. Stop it. By what right have you dragged me back? Vanish and be saved. And he vanished. From somewhere came caroling voices and an ineffably sweet harmony, which I could not associate with any instruments I had ever heard. For an instant there came over me an exquisite longing to forget myself and my misery and join that chorus. But then I remembered Flurry and George Smiley, and doggedly I went on with my search. Half an eternity, it seemed, of toiling search. It took me a long while to discover that other one, a long while. I felt I had swum through a light year of mist, had fallen through the bottom of the universe and had scrambled skyward to the sun itself. But I found him. He was a definite shape before I had any chance to think of him. And when I thought him not there, he was still there. I had found him. He was above me, perhaps 50 feet, and he seemed to be sitting on air and dangling his feet over the edge. Great gouts of mist rolled between us, blotting us from another sight. 
But each time the mist cleared, there we were again. I could not contain myself for joy. And he seemed to feel the same, the same way. For he waved his arms down at me and beckoned me up. I beckoned him to come down. We must have been further apart than it seemed to our eyes, for he could not hear me, nor I him. He was evidently frightened to let go of his perch in air, and so I had to take the initiative. I looked along the way from me to him and thought hard about a stair, and step by step the stair appeared. I ran up it, shouting at him the while, but in my enthusiasm, I forgot the stair and it vanished. I landed as soon as I was frightened of Earth's impact and again built the stair. This time, I looked at the steps as I went up, and this time, I arrived. He was a diminutive fellow with a face which attested to a belligerent turn of mind. And his first greeting to me was, Did you do all this? No, George Smiley did it. Who? George Smiley. I must have been an Earthman. I'm from Carvin myself. Never heard of it. Well, it was a nice place. I was researching on the regime of Vaso and the Hoymanen, and all of a sudden, my book vanished. And here I was. Uh, here I am. Here we both are, I said. I've been looking all over for you. I need help. Did you see those stairs I just built? Yes, but they're gone now. Wasn't such a good job. Well, I've discovered that all we have to do is think of something real hard and then it will come about. And if we can remember it. If we can remember it. I've been trying to concentrate on a ham sandwich for a day and a half, but I keep forgetting it before I can eat it. Oops. There it goes again. Now look, I'll think about it too. No, let's get something to sit on first. I don't know what's under me, and I don't- Don't say that, said I, barely saving him from falling. All right, we'll think of a table. There, there's a table. Now you keep thinking about that table while I get a couple of chairs. He shut his eyes and kept a grip on the table. I shut mine and imagined us sitting on the chairs. And then there we were, sitting on chairs. It's gone. And sure enough, the table was gone. We had thought too hard about chairs. Finally, we managed to feel natural and remember chairs and think of the table too. And so with some relief, we alternated thinking about things until we had something to eat and drink. But the trouble was that each time we would take a bite of something, we would forget about the table and the food would plummet out of sight. Somehow we filled up and then looking thoughtful, he said, You know, if we could just get practiced enough to think about all sorts of things, you and I, we could build the world back about the way we want it. But the first thing we've got to do is put the sun in the sky. I'm sick of this murk. All right, I'll think about the sun. And the sun shone brightly down. I must have been fairly well in practice, for I kept on talking and kept the sun up there at the same time. Now you think of Earth. He thought about Earth, and a sort of uneasy motion was set up under us and flashy bits of scenery popped into view and vanished and popped up again. Chinese tombs and a far off domed city and a ferry boat on a lake all appeared and disappeared. It's not much use. It just can't be done all at once. Let's imagine one town and then when we get used to that and believe in it, well, imagine the fields around it. All right, but we really ought to imagine something to build the town on. A great globe in the sky, 25,000 miles in circumference. Let's be different. As long as you and I can do this by ourselves, we'll just put this together on some new principles. 
There's no use copying what we've already had. Now, how about living inside the Earth? Why, we... Why, why, we're... Yes, yes, we're... Oh, no, gentlemen. Said a circle sardonic voice, and we both whipped around to find George Smiley standing there in his flash text cape. If there is anything to be built, then I shall build it. You two are the most stubborn of all, but you've agreed with each other, and now you can agree with me. I worked for years to sell the world the idea of non-existence, and if anyone intends to build a world, then it shall be me. We'll put that sun in my sky. And he waved his hand toward it, and the sun went out. We've got a perfect right. You have no right, grinned George Smiley. I faded all things into nothingness, even time for myself, and became, and because I made the whole world believe and all the universe, then the universe is mine, and I shall build. Why, you're trying to set yourself up as... Yes, said George Smiley to my friend. Yes, indeed. We have just as much right. I shall then give you half of it, the lower, hotter half. I shall create a world for you to rule alone. No, protested my friend. Yes. It's a quaint idea. I got it from an old book. Now be gone, both of you. And suddenly we were falling again. But this time, no matter how much ground I thought about, no ground was there to stay me. My friend was soon separated from me and he did not see the water which suddenly spread below me. I know he did not, for he was still falling when last I saw him. As for myself, I climbed out on a muddy bank of the Seine and wrung the water out of my clothes. The United States Marines didn't even ask me any questions when they locked me in their jail as a possible enemy airman. And I didn't volunteer any answers. I was too glad not to have to think about that bunk before I stretched out upon it. George Smiley can have the universe for all I'll ever care. <laughs>